Do you have a sense of what the philosophy that characterizes Unix is? The design, not just the initial, but just carry through the years. Just being there, being around it, what's the fundamental philosophy behind the system? I think one aspect of the fundamental philosophy was to provide an environment that made it easy to write or easier, productive to write programs. So it was meant as a programmer environment. It wasn't meant specifically as something to do some other kind of job. For example, it was used extensively for word processing, but it wasn't designed as a word processing system. It was used extensively for lab control, but it wasn't designed for that. It was used extensively as a front end for big other systems, big dumb systems, but it wasn't designed for that. It was meant to be an environment where it was really easy to write programs so the programmers could be highly productive. And part of that was to be a community. And there's some observation from Dennis Ritchie, I, th I think at the end of the book, that says that, and that from from his standpoint, the real goal was to uh, create a community where people could work uh, as programmers on a system. And I think in that sense, certainly for many, many years, it succeeded quite well at that. And part of that is the technical aspects of because it made it really easy to write programs, people did write interesting programs, those programs tended to be used by other programmers, and so it was kind of a virtuous circle uh, of more and more stuff coming out that was really good for programmers. And you were part of that community of programmers. So what was it like writing programs on that early Unix? It was a blast, it really was. <laughs> you know, I like to program. I'm not a terribly good programmer, but it was a lot of fun to write code. And in the early days, there was an enormous amount of what you would today, I suppose, call low-hanging fruit. People hadn't done things before, and this was this new environment, and the, the whole combination of nice tools and very responsive system and tremendous colleagues made it possible to write code. You could, you could have an idea in the morning. You could do a, a, you know, an experiment with it. You could have something limping along that night or the next day, and people would react to it, and they would say, oh, that's wonderful, but you're really screwed up here. And and the feedback loop was then very, very short and tight. And so a lot of things got developed fairly quickly that um, in many cases still exist today. And I think that was part of what made it fun because programming itself is fun. It's puzzle solving in a variety of ways, but I think it's even more fun when you do something that somebody else then uses. Even if they whine about it not working, the fact that they used it is is part of the reward mechanism. And what was the method of an interaction, the communication when you do that feedback loop? I mean, this is before the internet. Certainly before the internet. Um, it was mostly physical right there. You know, somebody would come into your office and say something. So um, these places are all close by, like offices oh yeah. are nearby, so oh yeah. you're really lively in interaction. Yeah, yeah. No, Bell Labs was fundamentally one giant building, and most of the people were involved in this Unix stuff were in two or three corridors, and there was a room. Oh, how big was it? Probably call it 50 feet by 50 feet. Make up a number of that, which had some access to computers there as well as in offices and people hung out there and it had a coffee machine. And so th there was a, it was mostly very physical. We did use email, of course. Um, and, but it was fundamentally all for a long time, all on one machine. So there was no need for internet. It's fascinating to think about what computing would be today without Bell Labs. It seems so many, the people being in the vicinity of each other, it's sort of getting that quick feedback, working together, so, so many brilliant people. It, I don't know where else that could have existed in the world, I mean, given how that came together. What, <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, how does that make you feel, that, that's that well, little element of history? Well, I think that's very nice, but it, in a sense, it's survivor bias. And right. if it hadn't happened at Bell Labs, there were other places that were doing really interesting work as well. Xerox Park is perhaps the that's most right. obvious yeah. one. Xerox Park contributed an enormous amount of good material. Um, and many of the things we take for granted today in the same way came from Xerox Park experience. I don't think they capitalized in the long run as much. Their parent company was perhaps not as lucky in capitalizing on this. Who knows? But that would that's certainly another place where there was a tremendous amount of uh, influence. There were a lot of good university activities. MIT was <laughs> obviously no slouch in this kind of thing, and, yeah. and others as well. Um, so Unix 
turned out to be open source because of the various ways that AT&T operated and sort of it had to, um, it was, the focus was on telephones. So well, I think that's a mischaracterization in a sense. It absolutely was not open source. It was yeah. very definitely proprietary, licensed, but it was licensed freely to universities in ah. source code form for many years. And because of that, generations of university students and their faculty people uh, grew up knowing about uh, Unix and that there was enough expertise in the community that it then became possible for people to kind of go off in their own direction and build something that looked Unix-like. Um, the Berkeley version of Unix started with that licensed code and gradually picked up enough of its own uh, code contributions, notably from people like Bill Joy, that uh, eventually it was able to become completely free of any AT&T code. Now, there was an enormous amount of legal jockeying around this that in the late, early to late 80s, early 90s, something like that. Um, and then uh, not some... I guess the open source movement might have started when Richard Stallman started to think about this in the late 80s. And by 1991, when Torvalds decided he was going to do a Unix-like operating system, there was enough expertise that uh, in the community that first he had a target. He could see what to do because the, the kind of the Unix system call interface and the tools and so on were there. Um, and so he was able to build a, an operating system that at this point, when you say Unix, in many cases, what you're really thinking is Linux. Linux, yeah. But it's, it's funny that from my distant perception, I felt that Unix was open source without actually knowing it. But what you're really saying, it was just uh, freely licensed. So, it was freely licensed. So I've... it felt open source in a sense, because universities are not trying to make money. So they're, it felt open source in a sense that you can get access if you wanted. Right. And, and a very, very, very large number of universities had the license and they were able to talk to all the other universities who had the license. And so technically not open, technically belonging to AT&T, pragmatically pretty open. And so there's a ripple effect that all the faculty and the students then all grew up and then they went throughout the world and uh, permeated in that kind of way. So what uh, kind of features do you think make for a good operating system? If you take the lessons of uh, Unix, you said, you know, make it easy for programmers. Like that, that seems to be uh, an important one. But also, Unix turned out to be exceptionally robust and efficient. Right. So is that an accident when you focus on the programmer, or is that a natural outcome? I think part of the reason for efficiency was that it began on extremely modest hardware. Very, very, very tiny. And so you couldn't get carried away. You couldn't do a lot of complicated things because... You just didn't have the resources, either processor speed or memory. And so that enforced a certain uh, minimality of mechanisms and maybe a search for generalizations so that you would find one mechanism that served for a lot of different things rather than having lots of different special cases. I think the file system uh, in Unix is a good example of that. The file system interface in its fundamental form is extremely straightforward. And that means that you can write code uh, very, very effectively for the file system. And then one of those ideas, one of those generalizations is that, gee, that file system interface works for all kinds of other things as well. And so in particular, the idea of reading and writing to devices is the same as reading and writing to a disk that has a file system. And then that gets carried further in other parts of the world. Processes become, in effect, files in a file system. Um, and the Plan 9 operating system, which came along, I guess, in the late 80s or something like that, uh, took a lot of those ideas from the original Unix and tried to push the generalization even further so that in Plan 9, a lot of different resources are file systems. They all share that interface. So that would be one example uh, where finding the right model of how to do something means that an awful lot of things become simpler. And it means, therefore, that more people can do useful, interesting things with them without having to think as hard about it.